Hello, this is Daryl Castle with today's Castle Report. This is Friday, the 16th day of July in the year 2021, and on this report, I will be talking about the U.S. Navy and its readiness for combat as determined by a recent congressional inquiry. Yes, folks, Congress, or I should say some members of Congress, are so concerned by reports coming from the Navy, including accidents at sea, fires at sea, cancellations of expensive projects, and so forth, that they commissioned a study in a report, which is the subject of this Castle report. The Castle family, however, is doing quite well this week as we try to find something of what is left of those things we used to call normal. We haven't been together as a family in about two years, so this weekend we will gather for a reunion. Joan and I are looking forward to it, but the family daughter will unfortunately be unable to leave Fortress Los Angeles. There are many things of a current nature I could talk about today, things like the long-term dangers of intentionally destroying legal institutions, customs, traditions that have lasted centuries to achieve a short-term goal, things like the President of the United States channeling Joe Stalin, i.e., it's not who votes, it's who counts the votes that matters. Yes, Comrade Joe, we know. That's why you're so afraid of voter ID. But instead, instead of talking about those things, I've decided to continue last week's report on how this new politically correct world is affecting the U.S. military's readiness for combat. I will confess I've always loved the Navy. I spent many days being transported around the oceans of the world by the U.S. Navy when I served in the Marine Corps. I've seen The North Atlantic, I've seen the South Pacific, all thanks to the U.S. Navy. That's why my ears always perk up when I hear or read stories about the current conditions of the Navy. The current condition is troubling, according to members of Congress. So they decided to find out exactly what's going on in the U.S. Navy. Several recent incidents, including collisions at sea between warships, a fire that killed some sailors, the cancellation of a shipbuilding project in which hundreds of millions of dollars had already been invested. Families complained to Congress when their kids in the Navy complained to them. So Senator Tom Cotton, Congressman Jim Banks, Congressman Dan Crenshaw, Congressman Mike Gallagher led a commission to appoint Lieutenant General Robert E. Schmedley, USMC, retired, and Rear Admiral Mark Montgomery, USN, retired to investigate and report back to Congress in writing. The review of the Navy was nonpartisan. It consisted of the usual ship tours, but more importantly, many long-form interviews with numerous personnel, both commissioned officers and enlisted. They sought to get to the bottom of a series of damaging operational failures in the Navy's surface warfare fleet. Can the Navy still fight? Could it defeat the Chinese Navy on the high seas? Congress wanted to know. Thus, this review was conducted. Concern ran high, and after this review, you might have similar concerns. Concerns within the Navy ran so high that when asked whether incidents such as the two destroyer collisions in the Pacific, the surrender of a small craft in the Arabian Sea, the burning Oh, the Bonhomme Richard and other incidents were part of a broader cultural or leadership problem in the Navy. 94% said yes, 3% said no, 3 were unsure. When asked if the incidents were directly connected, 55% said yes, 16 no, 29 were unsure. The sentiment among serving officers and men of the Navy that the Navy is dangerously off course then was overwhelming. There were six or seven issues that most of the sailors raised as as problematic. Those issues were, number one, insufficient leadership focus on war fighting. Finding and sinking enemy fleets should be the primary mission of the Navy, but for many reasons, that is barely taught anymore. The result is a lack of confidence in leadership. Number two, a dominant and paralyzing zero defect mentality, a single mistake is often career-ending. Admirals like Bull Halsey and Chester Nimitz who led the United States Navy to victory in World War II would not even make captain in today's Navy, they said. Under Number three, under invest, uh, investment in surface warfare officer training. Under investment in surface warfare officer training. Submarines and aviation branches 
the glamorous ones get most of the money and most of the attention, poorly resourced, and executed surface ship maintenance programs was number four. Poorly resourced and executed surface maintenance ship programs canceled, delayed. Poorly performed maintenance programs was a common complaint. Number five, expanding culture of micromanagement technology now allows shore-based admirals to exercise unprecedented control over captains at sea. That control results in a toxic lack of initiative and accountability. Six, current over-responsiveness to media culture. Sailors see Navy leadership as overly responsive, unyielding news cycles. They confuse which issues and which stories demand a response and which should be ignored. There were a few other issues brought up with less universality, like surface officers are inadequately trained as good ship handlers. A tsunami of administrative tasks distract from war training. The Navy is way too small to accomplish its global mission. Most importantly, sailors and their officers lack resiliency. They're unprepared for the difficulties of combat, in part because their training has de-emphasized persistent exposure to adversity. So that is what actual sailors think is wrong with the U.S. Navy. Let's look at some of the specific comments made about those things. The interviewers found a common refrain among those at sea. One recent destroyer captain lamented that, quote, where someone puts their time shows what their priorities are. We've got so many messages about XYZ Appreciation Month or Sexual assault, assault Prevention or you name it. We don't even have close to that same level of emphasis on actual war fighting, end quote. A quote from another serving captain, quote, we'll spend hours on drill weekends on like, what's the checklist for this place? Do you have all the right uniforms but nothing for what is the current situation in China? What are things the Chinese are concerned about? What are the Iranians concerned about? What are upcoming war possibilities? How do we understand those things and their implications? We should know the worst case scenarios and what the greater context is, but there is none of that now, end quote. One surface warfare officer said, I've never heard anyone in any congressional testimony that I could think of that talks about actually winning wars. So that's not to absolve the Navy of its responsibility, but that's just stunning to me, end quote. Another officer, quote, lethality, I don't think was touted or promoted, or a war, warrior culture of innovation was not encouraged, was generally frowned upon. Just check the box is a risk-adverse culture, end quote. The risk-adverse one, mistake, one mistake, you're gone, was most common complaint by far. It degrades lethality, atrophies talent, inhibits reenlistment, encourages careerism, advances those who avoid risk and avoid challenges. Secretary of the Navy, Lehman, who built the 600-ship Navy we once had, then went on to a billion-dollar corporation, said that if the zero policy was in a place when I was in the Navy, I wouldn't have made it past Lieutenant J.G., a warship captain talked about escorting ships through the Persian Gulf and other oil checkpoints and being fearful that admirals were looking at me, looking at cameras in my command center, watching every move I made. So that's a pretty good look at the problems in the Navy. I often wonder about certain ships that are sent <coughs> into what appears to be harm's way, unnecessarily sent, I might add. I wonder if those in charge understand that such actions <clears throat> can lead to a confrontation that requires a response which then leads to general war in the years I floated on Navy ships to different areas of the world. The captain was supreme. He was the unquestioned ruler of the ship and all on board. Nobody questioned him. Instead, he questioned you. The captain set the culture, and that's why the culture varied from ship to ship. But one thing was always certain. That was in a life-or-death battle. He was trained and equipped to get his ship through it. One last quote from a serving surface naval warfare officer, which was most meaningful to me. <coughs> and if the civilian and naval leadership would just listen to her, the men and the women of the U.S. Navy would be just fine. Yes, this officer is a woman. She's also a black woman. I'm paraphrasing what she said because I'm not looking 
had her direct quote right now, but it's very close. She said, we get a lot of in instruction today about diversity, about how race affects us and all that, how we are to treat each other all the time. But there is no instruction about how we're going to defeat the Chinese Navy. One thing I know for sure, and that is, if a Chinese missile cuts this ship in half, we will all bleed the same color blood. <clears throat> but the next war is very likely to be a surface fleet war against the Chinese, Russian, and Iranian navies, God forbid. It's all three at the same time, but that's not a far-fetched scenario. The last surface warfare war the Navy had to fight was 76 years ago. And in that one, the Navy had the unquestioned efforts of the nation, its people, its industrial capacity today. By contrast, none of those things can be truthfully said to exist. Instead, we have weak leadership at the civilian level. No, no, let me... Rephrase that, we have no leadership at the civilian level. The military responds to the civilian leadership symbolically circles the wagons. Ducks make ducks, as they say in the military, and that means risk-averse bureaucratic officers are trained by others just like them. Naval ships at sea have televisions on board. The sailors watch the same brave politicians that you and I do. They're more aware than you are that serious problems with integrating women into the armed services alongside men exist. Those problems often affect training for war. The fact that the Chinese and Russian navies are well aware of those problems, they've studied the report just as I did, is not lost on the men and women of the Navy. Our enemies perceive weakness. That's obvious to anyone paying attention. The Chinese Navy, <coughs> which now exceeds the U.S. in total ships, is throwing its weight around in the Pacific, as is the Russian Navy, while Biden and Putin met direct, directly Recently at the G7 conference, a Russian battle fleet conducted war games 24 miles from Hawaii. That kind of provocation has never been done before because they feared us. That fear was military, economic, and financial, but now all they see is weakness and confusion. <coughs> Winning a war is, of course, the goal of fighting a war when survival is an issue. The real goal should be to remain strong enough to not be challenged. If you're going to strut across the globe as an international bully, as the U.S. has unfortunately done in recent years, then you must absolutely carry the big stick. In conclusion, folks, this is all foreign to me because it's not the Marine Corps way, not the one I served in anyway. It's not the Navy that transported us to foreign shores in training if we went out on a 12-mile march with all our gear, we were very tired. At the end of the day, one mile from home, there was a muddy river with a perfectly good bridge over it. We walked through the muddy river because we were going there was no bridge. We were trained by officers who had already been there, who exuded confidence. I sure hope the military esprit de corps can somehow be restored. But it will take changes from top to bottom. It's hard to see that happening now, given the current climate of the political world. Finally, folks, the Navy should not be the first center of social experimentation. Its purpose is to defend the life of the nation by locating the enemy fleet and destroying it. It will take years to repair these problems if repair is even attempted. The right person, however, could take this report that the general and the admiral prepared and straighten out these problems in a year if that person had the authority and the budget to accomplish what needed to be done. Good people are hard to find these days. At least that's the way I see it. Till next time, folks, this is Daryl Castle. Thanks for listening. <laughs>